I, I just want to say a few words on behalf of Peters Valley. Um, and they're words I'm sure that many of you've heard um, uh, repeated over the last uh, two months of this horrible storm that we're in. Um, but uh, the Valley is, I've been here for 20 years. My name is Bruce Danner, by the way, and I run the ceramics program. And uh, I've been here for 20 years and this is pretty sad this year. Um, but I don't want I don't want the evening to to have that spirit to it. I I want the evening to actually have a positive note. And and I think a couple of the positive notes here, the silver linings in the cloud, are are uh, that number one. I think that we all of us have learned um, just what creativity and uh, art practice making. Uh, being part of a creative community uh, means to all of us, um, no matter what our roles are within that. And um, I don't think, speaking for myself, I will ever take that for granted again. Um, and uh, so I want all of you to know who are with us tonight uh, and staff and administration, how much I uh, appreciate my my place here in this community. and. Um, going forward, I'm really looking forward to what we can do in the future and when this thing passes, because this, this thing is going to pass. And we're going to come out of it, I think, in, uh, a, in ways that are better than we could have ever imagined. And um, so we really, speaking on behalf of everyone here at Peters Valley, we really appreciate you. We miss you and uh, we love you, you know? And um, number two, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate the instructors who um, have uh, offered to and have agreed to spend the next, um, you know, numbers of weeks and months uh, presenting their work um, because they're doing it on their own backs. And uh, this technology is, it's, it's crazy stuff. <laughs> And, um, and so we really appreciate all of you instructors who have been willing to, to uh, show up and uh, share with us the work that you make and the ideas that you have rolling around. Um, and, then, and then also I wanna thank Lakota because Lakota Gulick is the assistant in the gallery and Lakota on top of shepherding the instructors and, and so forth, she's had to shepherd me and today has been pretty crazy um, the last few days in, in terms of trying to get this to work and so forth. And here I am rattling on, but I really want, I really want to thank Lakota for all the hard work that she's done to, to try to make this work. And please do bear with us. Um, and uh, I hope you really enjoy the evening. Remember, it's every Friday night at 7 o'clock, so please join, join with us uh, with that, okay? So... One, uh, just a little housekeeping we need to do is you need to uh, mute your audio. Everybody needs to mute that. Um, like I said to the instructors earlier that we don't want wild dogs jumping across the screen and, and, uh, and barking and so forth. <laughs> um, so thank you for doing that. And um, the first presenter tonight, we're going to go with Eric Naki. And Eric, I met down in, in North Carolina um, several years ago. And Eric was going to be teaching the, the ceramics workshop here. And he is, uh, I've seen him work. And he is, um, you know, he's a force to be reckoned with and so forth. But his, uh, his bio, a little bit about Eric before he presents. Um, he had a, his bio reads that uh, Eric Naki had a very bad attitude towards pottery as a child and young adult. Towards the end of his time at university, he touched clay for the first time and after that could no longer imagine doing anything else with his life. He subsequently worked for two years with ceramist Jeff Shapiro and for six months with Isazaki Jun, living national treasure of the Zen Japan. In 2011, Eric discovered the Argentine tango and now splits his passions between clay work and dancing. In addition, he enjoys playing pinball, hiking, and checking the cloud formations for the face of Elvis. Eric lives in Asheville, North Carolina with his wife, Kristen. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm gonna go to the screen share now and hope this works. Yay. You're there. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me and thanks to everybody for uh, showing up to listen and check it out. Um, usually in these presentations, I go chronologically from the beginning, but I think I'm gonna go backwards this time. Um, about two weeks ago, I just moved in to my new studio on some land I have. It's been my kiln site for some years, about a half, half hour north of Asheville. Um, but I, I just moved in uh, a couple weeks ago. So this is the view from my workstation. And this is the back corner with two really important pieces of pottery equipment. Those are my two pinball machines there. I love it. It just 10 minute breaks of pinball in the studio heal my soul. Um, so this studio uh, is on my land, but th this was my, my previous studio for seven years until February of last year. Um, and it, it was an old schoolhouse built in 1929. Uh, I had a lot of space. It was basically like a uh, one step up from a squat. There was a there was a landlord, but it was really a punk rock space. We paid almost nothing. There was no heat, minimal electricity, but I loved it. And then uh, February fourth last year, uh, one of the other people in the studio went crazy and burned it down. So I got a call at three in the morning from my landlord saying the studio was on fire. Uh, this was this was by far the most interesting experience of my life. Uh, it, it was transformative in all sorts of ways that that you could get into, but but I think the two biggest uh, the two biggest things were that um, it was like a clean slate. Even though I lost everything, it was just really it was just a fresh start. And the other thing is that uh, having your studio burned down is an incredible excuse for just about anything you want to get get out of for say. A, Two, two or three months, you have an amazing excuse. Oh, and then just as a, just as a funny aside, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with Asheville, but it's a real kind of stereotypical hippie town. And uh, this is the onion article aspect about the whole arson thing. A after uh, after the, the arsonist burned down the studio, um, he kidnapped another one of, one of my friends, my, my neighbor, and demanded to be taken to Whole Foods to get something to eat. He couldn't, couldn't deal with, uh, you know, GMOs or something like that. So he needed to go to a healthy food store. I just thought that sounded like an, an article, arsonist demands Whole Foods. So right after, oh, that's, this is the, that's my slab roller. And that's the studio cleared out after they excavated it. So that was February of last year. And then right after that, I got to go to a place called Starworks in uh, North Carolina for, um, for a two month residency that was part of, a, part of the North Carolina State Arts Council. So this is two months worth of work. And my project was to explore some larger work um, and some technical aspects of, of building large work from, from multiple pieces. Um, that idea, Oh, that, that's one of, the, one of the larger pieces in the kiln. And some of the finished work, that's about a six foot, six foot tall piece made from nine individual pieces. I lost my visual. So this is some, some of the new work uh, in the last year that was derivative of that work. And that, that project uh, last year came out of something else I had done I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, that had come out of a project uh, I did a couple of years ago at NC Pottery Center. This is something, a series they do one or two every year called Fire Sculptures. They're site-built sculptures 
fired in this kiln. And there's a design requirement where they have to be uh, perforated to let the hot gas flow from the inside to the outside. Most previous artists that I saw just kind of perforated normal, their normal work. Um, I wanted to, to integrate that design requirement to the actual aesthetics. So I came up with um, something like this, which, which led to the, the current work. Uh, actually, I prefer to make small work, even though these are about six feet long. They're really comprised of uh, pieces that are only six or seven inches long. And there's just something that's so, so fun and, and um, fluid about working with ceramics on a, on a small scale. This is my work over the last few years. Um, I, I like to keep a, a number of different series going. Um, and at present, most of my work is, is really just sculpture. Um, in 2011, I had another important moment where, where I'd been making uh, vessels and cups and, and vases until then. And I wanted to make sculpture, but was scared, frankly. Um, and so, so I, one night of sketching on Thanksgiving weekend in 2011 in this kiln room, and I, I laid out my designs for, for body of work that I'm still working on. And actually something similar happened in uh, the, the, the year 2000 when I was living in Thailand, where I was in a, a kiln room sketching and drew a few things, and it took years to, to get through all of it. This is one of the, the pieces I made right before I transitioned to making just sculpture. So this is a vase. And this is, this is some of my work during my apprenticeship. Um, I did a two year apprenticeship with Jeff Shapiro in upstate New York, which was fantastic. Um, it's it's such an interesting way to learn and, and my main goal in it was I just wanted to see how everything fits together any particular piece of uh, particular piece of information could be had lots of different ways but seeing how a working artist makes it work was really the, the most important thing to me um, this is also some work from my apprenticeship and these are some cups so uh, during that time I, I gave myself a, a assignment of making only pinched cups for a year, and I'm glad I did. I, I think that depth of study translates to breadth in a way that isn't exactly reciprocal, um, and I still like making cups. And this is this is a piece uh, of mine in the the Mint Museum in Charlotte. I, about six months ago, I got to see it for the first time there, and the reason I put this up, I was just so honored. They put it next to a piece of Stephen DeStabler's over to the right. And that, that I, I was just blown away by that because that was the very, a similar piece of work to what, to what he's got here was in front of the, the children's um, theater in, in Minneapolis. And every, uh, maybe once a month from when I was about five years old to 12 years old, we walked past that sculpture and it was, the, I think the most influential thing in my, my early career. And the, the reason is because I couldn't understand it. It was like sublime confusion looking at these, these um, stabler figures. So it was really an honor to have uh, my work put next to his. And then actually it was on the other side of it was Christina Cordova's work, um, which is an equal honor. So that's it, that's my work. Thank you, Eric. Lakota, can you hear, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, did Ghazali, was he able to get back on? Yes, he is under Jen. 
Great. Ghazali, how you doing? Can you hear him, Lakota? I think he's on there now. Ghazali, can you hear me? I think you unmuted the wrong Jennifer. I'm oh, sorry, you're under the same name. <laughs> Ghazali, are you there? Hi, it's Jen. <laughs> <laughs> He came in under my ID, so we're sharing an identity right now. Oh, I see. <laughs> there okay. he is. Okay, so I'm going to go off of mine now. Okay. okay. Sorry Thanks, about that. Jen. Thank you. Ghazali, can you hear me now? He's muted. Okay. Okay, how about now? Is Ghazali present with us? Um, he is there. He just needs to unmute himself. Ghazali, are you there now? So Lakota, maybe we should go on to Lori. Sure. And uh, let's see if we have Lori's audio there. <clears throat> Lori, are you with us? Let's see. Can you hear me? I can hear. Is that Lori? Yep. Yes. Are you ready? I am ready. Hold on. Let me just. And we will we will uh, run Ghazali <laughs> at the at the end there. All right. Okay. So yeah. the the next instructor you're going to hear from is Lori Ryan, who is going to be teaching photography. Lori's a native of Scranton, Pennsylvania. She's a photographer and artist living and working in Northeastern Pennsylvania. She received an AFA from Keystone College and a BFA in photography from Tyler School of Art. Her photographs have appeared in national magazines such as Field and Stream and Woman's World. And her fine artwork has been exhibited in New York City, New York, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Trenton, New Jersey, Scranton, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and notably, the State Museum of Pennsylvania in Harrisburg. Over the last 16 years, Lori dedicated her time to her family, raising her two children while building her portrait and commercial business, Lori Ryan Photography. For the last decade, Lori was an adjunct instructor in the Turok School of Visual Arts of Keystone College, La Plume, Pennsylvania. Currently, Lori is curator of the Art Gallery, Three Hammers Winery, and is co-director of the Camera Work Gallery in Scranton. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, thank you, Bruce, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and uh, just one note in regards to your, the last thing that you said about my, um, my bio, one perk of being a curator of a gallery and a winery is that I, I get to drink a lot of wine. So <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really nice perk. Um, so anyway, um, thanks again, everyone. Uh, so I um, was planning on teaching, uh, manipulating the light, um, something that, you know, I, I just love to play with the most, obviously, when it comes to photography is just how many different ways I can use different light sources um, to create the work. Um, so uh, for many years, honestly, since college, I have always liked to work in uh, multiples of images, <clears throat> particularly diptychs. Uh, so this is just an example of, of a diptych that I did a few years ago. And um, it was the Northeastern Biennial, won, actually won an award for that. 
which was really nice. Um, and uh, a, a fun story behind this couple is this is uh, the parents of one of my longtime friends, uh, my friend Jack. I've known him since I'm 12 years old. And I pretty much grew up going to his house. And um, I had, he of course moved away. I moved away over all those years. And, you know, we get back together after, after many years and his parents still live in the house that he grew up in. So, um, so I got to go back to their house and I walk in and here is this wallpaper that um, it was still on the walls. And I was like, oh my gosh, I really need to photograph in front of these, in front of this, uh, this wallpaper. So, um, so here are Jack's parents. Um, Bootsy is his father and, uh, and his, ma his mother, who we always just affectionately called Ma, um, and so I, I put them in front of this wallpaper in their hallway and I just loved that reflective quality. Um, and so I just decided to, to uh, use a snoot on um, a strobe light. Um, something that, uh, that I like to use often, there's different ways that you can use a snoot on a light. And um, so in this case, this is just uh, one way to use it on a, on a strobe light. And I'll be showing a, another photo in, in a little bit that I also use a snoot, but just in a different way. So, um, so as I was photographing them, I, uh, I just asked them to face each other. And so Bootsy immediately put his hands up on her chest. And, uh, so, and obviously you can see her reaction, which was just priceless. And so I was just, so happy to uh, to be able to witness that from these um, this lovely couple that I've known since I was twelve. So um, so yeah, so that's that. So here um, this is Matisse. Matisse is um, uh, my friend Kelly's horse. I actually photographed Matisse twenty five years ago. Matisse actually just turned thirty. Uh, this past year, and I photographed her 25 years ago, not long after Kelly had uh, had gotten her, and then um, just um, a few years ago, I was doing some work for a company called Fur Tree. If you notice the the photo on the right hand side, uh, the the gloves with the uh, you know the logo conveniently placed, um, oh, a fur tree. Uh, the uh, owners of the the shop just asked me, you know, can you photograph our gloves in, you know, maybe non-conventional ways? They're honestly just used for gardening and pruning and stuff like that. So, so I was like, hey, my friend has a horse. Uh, I'm going to contact her. I haven't seen her in a long time, and I'll see if I can go and photograph her horse again. So that worked out really well, uh, specifically for my client. They absolutely loved the images. Um, and uh, but then the image on the right was or the left is just uh, basically another portrait of Matisse. Um, so nice to be able to take another portrait of her after so many years of uh, of not seeing her. Um, both applications uh, kind of done basically done in the same way, um, but with uh, different um, scenarios. So obviously the one that's on the left is an indoor. Um, a scenario uh, light is very very dim in there in that kind of indoor stable there that ring and so using a you know a couple of different strobe lights and then uh, the one to the right is exterior um, in front of that beautiful red barn it was we just happened to have an amazing day beautiful blue, um, blue sky and that red barn behind her and um, we were in the shadows and then I just positioned um, one light actually in this case to uh to photograph her to just a kind of popper so it worked out really well just this is really nice highlight in her eyes there to give her some life and she was just beautiful and and uh, it brought my son with me who actually got to ride her and that was the first time he, he was ever on a horse so so that was really cool uh so this um this is Autumn uh, from one of our multiple of our um, uh, family trips camping. 
Uh, she's not my daughter. She's my friend's uh, third daughter out of four. And um, I just loved uh, the way she was just sitting there quietly making a gigantic mess with this moon sand. Um, and uh, so the light was very dim. It was, it was dusk, you know, the sun was down and uh, I just happened, you know, I had my camera and um, an off camera flash. So another different type of source of light uh, that I just kind of popped her with there to, uh, to capture. So she was, she was always great to, to photograph. Uh, so uh, these two, we have uh, Yanush on the left and Pedro on the right. Uh, Yanush I photographed actually in New York City in this huge, beautiful studio. Um, and with and here's two different sources of light. So uh, uh, natural light pouring in through the windows in the background, very nice, soft, and then actually a hot light, which is to his left, which is, creates this really nice, uh, warm light, um, and then that cool, the coolness of the um, natural light coming through the window in the back just offers a little bit more depth. Um, if that hot light just kind of, you know, hit the back, it kind of would flatten the space. So a little bit of a cool natural light in the background um, helps to just create a little bit of depth there. And he, he was just such a cool guy. And actually, he's a, a fashion photographer. He's been published in multiple, multiple, uh, uh, contemporary magazines. Uh, Pedro on the uh, right, um, interesting guy. Uh, he's um, Portuguese. I met him when I was in uh, Italy uh, doing actually a, a great workshop, photo workshop in Tuscany. I wasn't teaching it, I was actually taking it. Uh, but we had this opportunity uh, to spend a whole week with just a great group of people and uh, basically traipsed around the Tuscany countryside and photographed. And so I was um, uh, basically doing portraits the whole time while I was there. So Pedro was one of my classmates, a beautiful man. And so we, the, the castle uh, that we were in was actually uh, where the offices were for the workshop. So we were actually able to just kind of rip through the castle, use any room. Uh, the the light in that room was just so beautiful because of the stone, the walls, the floor, just beautiful warm color. And then I actually had a huge reflector that was off to uh, my left side that just kind of bouncing that natural light that's coming in through the window from behind him. And again, there's that same kind of warm, cool um, light that's happening there. Um, I just love the look that he was giving me. Um, I had asked him actually to to take off his boxer shorts and he refused um, nicely. Um, he refused and I understood, uh, you know, it's kind of strange. He wasn't normally a model. Um, but then after he saw the photograph, he he agreed with me. He said he, he should have taken the shorts off. So, oh, well, uh, it's still beautiful. Um, so, okay, so this is a start of a series, and actually, uh, you're going to see two rounds of this. Um, uh, my family and I went uh, out to Utah a few years ago, family vacation. It's just, uh, it was, I was kind of of the mindset of, I captured the landscape for the sake of my children so they wouldn't miss it, and then I captured them in the landscape and on the trip so I wouldn't miss it. Um, so I, I kind of just had that mindset for them. And so notice my son on the left-hand side, he's got the book. Um, I never thought in a million years I would ever tell my children to stop reading. But uh, while we were traveling, um, both of my children read five novels in a matter of two weeks, just because they were just, they spent so much time voraciously reading while we were driving. So, um, so that was really cool. But I kept saying, put down your book and look out the window. Uh, so anyway, um, these two photos, two very different applications um, as far as the way I um, dealt with the light. Um, capturing the outside in, a, in the same way. Uh, as far as exposing for the exterior, 
And then the interior, I used the same light source, which was an off-camera flash, which I usually use just like on this kind of cord that's, you know, tethered to my, to my camera. And I just, you know, point it in different directions, whatever. So the one on the left, just bouncing it off the ceiling, create this beautiful soft light. And then the one on the right is, was using a snoot. And so I'm back to the snoot, uh, like I, I mentioned earlier. So here, um, when I talked about doing diptychs, this is one of the diptychs that I created in regards to, um, to the images that we took on our family vacation. So this is Reading, Utah. This one is campsite in Colorado. So my husband actually did do that motion on the left-hand side, but uh, I made him do it again just because I wanted to photograph it. <laughs> so uh, we were stuck in Great Bend, Indiana for a day on our trip out there. So that's the one on the left. So Lori, we're just giving you a heads up for the 10 minutes. Okay, yep, and this is my last slide. Um, so. Yep, again, just using different light sources. Uh, the one on the right, really, uh, four different light sources right there. So I love combining different types of light, different color, just to really kind of get what I want. Um, these two images out of the, all of them had the most post-production that was required just to finish them. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate Great. it. Thank you, Lori. Our next presenter is going to be Sashka. Um, Sashka, are you ready to go? I think so. All right. I want to say a few words of where you are now before I start the video, just to have a little background. Sonia? Yes. Thank you. OK, okay. so Sashka is currently located in Panama. She's uh, living in the United States, in Pennsylvania, usually. So we were a little bit worried that we might have a storm or something like that, so our internet would break off. So we recorded the video instead, so I hope you enjoy it. Let us know what you thought about it. Here we go. Let me know if it works fine. I'm excited to be showing you my studio practice and the various inspirations behind my work. The first piece in a DNA series was shown in the Nuance exhibition at Peters Valley a year and a half ago. You will see I use the shadow of the... Is it too slow? I feel like it's too slow, right? It's not moving. Not moving. Okay, let me just try the lower resolution. I apologize for that. Okay. ...on the left, in the left-hand panel... I'm excited to be showing you my studio practice and the various inspirations behind my work. The first piece in a DNA series was shown in the Nuance exhibition at Peters Valley a year and a half ago. You will see I use the shadow of the drawing on the left in the left-hand panel of this four foot by six foot diptych oil on canvas. This is a smaller piece, three feet by four foot oil painting continuing with my interest in DNA for my personal reasons, and now universally due to COVID. These are clay monoprints continuing in the DNA series. I am printing using rollers and spoons to execute the prints onto a non-woven synthetic substrate called Rime. I use double spoons because the friction makes them so hot, it burns my fingers. I'm using the square edges of the spoon to work into the corners and the edges going in deeply, checking it as I'm printing, lifting it up, taking another look, and it peels right off the surface. These are some examples of finished clay monoprints in the DNA series. They are often finished with additional watercolor. You can see the texture of the printed texture on the remake. These are neurons and nuclei, 
And again, the texture. It's an engineered fabric for air conditioning filters, which is why it attracts the Tile 6 China Clay, which is mixed with the colors. I keep referring back to different natural items that I use in my compositions. These are pod pieces, one foot by four foot each panel. The colors that I see around me are so important in the colors I tend to select. And there's a huge plethora of butterflies that run their course and land up outside my front door. So it's a really cool thing. I'm also working on some sewing projects using satin covered cords, uh, calligraphy, making these heads. They're built up on necks, so they will be put on top of other objects, but it's so curious for me to see retrospectively how the colors feed into the work that I do. We're looking at some finished clay monoprints. Also in the DNA series, in the ether context, simple DNA, the sizes are 20 by 20, 20 by 26, and some are 15 by 35. The colors I use are mixed with tile six china clay, which is dissolved in water. It's a very dense, dry product that I bring down in suitcases, as well as all the colors. These are Akua fine quality artist pigments, water soluble, that I mix with the tile six. It can sometimes begin to dilute it, so I add some more tile six to it till I get a nice, dense uh, slurry colored. So that's the dry powder always mixed into water versus water into the powder. And it just drops down gravity till it's so dense, um, no more can be added. And then when I mix it, it makes a really nice thick slurry. Still sometimes need to add a dab. I use these colors and make different layers through patterns, grids. You can print onto the newsprint and make imagery and then squeegee that and press it onto the clay slab, which will then be printed onto the reme that we spoke about before. So the slab is high fire clay with a frame and then I'm working onto the slab keeping it moist all the while for the six months that I'm here and keep refurbishing it with more layers before I do the next prints. Smacking down the already squeegeed grid and it will then leave another image on the newsprint. I get lots of different patterns, grids, work directly with squeeze bottles. While it's semi-damp, you can turn it upside down onto a slab and have it adhere to the imagery below. I squeegee it and then roll it to have all the layers compressed together before I take a print. So these are surfaces on the clay slab with different imagery that is being built up onto it. If there is a relief, I can squeegee a lighter or a darker color to contra contrast and work from that. I'm working on some pieces with drapery and glass it's been very exciting to challenge myself with some new imagery. I put different natural pieces in front. 
the squash was grown on trees here, palm fronds uh, dried out the seed palms. I love the density of the, and the fineness of these gorgeous colors. More cocos. This is a piece I started before COVID, which is happier than some of the pieces that followed afterwards. That's my drapery setup and the flowers in front of it. So I'm working with that and a Zoom group from the Art Students League on portrait painting and the wonderful facilitator Janet Cook uses Photoshop to work with you on lining things up. Self-portraits, I'm quite absorbed with that. This is one as if I were to get COVID. This group of pieces is from a similar series on the same slab and I work over and over building and reducing. And here's a piece that's finished with watercolor. So the piece just is built up. Sometimes they're ghost images, which is what remains. And then I move forward in reducing or increasing the surfaces, the backgrounds, what have you. A lot of it's printed from drawing first on newsprint and printing that back onto the slab. This is one of the earlier pieces with a background and a tabletop showing the three tyrants. This is showing the three different slabs I work on while I'm down here for the duration of the winter, which has been months longer since COVID. So I have a 20 by 20, a 21 by 26, and a 35 by 15. Everything has to be kept wet during the non-printing days or else the slabs will crack up and be dry. This is uh, the last corner of my studio, some of my art supplies. And when I have a free day or two, I work on paintings of places I have loved to have been. I've really enjoyed speaking with everyone. Thank you, Sashka. <laughs> and Sonia, thank you. And thank you for the mom thing. Good job. Stay safe down there. Thank you. You two are out there. Our, our next artist, oh. instructor, is Thomas Sterner. Thomas, are you ready? Yes. Hello. I'm ready. Okay. Thomas Sterner is an artist, master printmaker, and sculptor. He revels in understanding how things are made and enjoys the discovery process of making and sharing his knowledge with others. His artwork seeks to elevate nature or ordinary objects to a revered stature through the use of motifs and imagery, making people think and smile. Thomas recently completed three public sculptures in Havard de Grace and, in, and Westminster, Maryland in 2019 and continues to exhibit in galleries and teach workshops. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for listening in. Uh, I'm a full-time artist living in Maryland. Um, I've been a gallery artist for the past 35 years with pretty good success selling my art through those galleries, but never completely able to provide a livelihood exclusively from making that art until three years ago when um, I took a turn and began pursuing public art commissions. I really enjoy working large and 
I appreciate the wider audience that now sees my work. Um, pictured here are my first and third public sculptures. I'm currently working on my fourth and fifth public sculptures to be installed at another site in September. Um, this presentation is a, a sort of a visual journey of making my second public sculpture, which was for Habit of Grace, Maryland, called Big Fish School of Fish. Um, there was a call to artists in October 2018 for which I applied. I was named a finalist and was interviewed and uh, refined my proposal. Uh, this sketch is the original idea. I then used Photoshop to create a compilation image and estimate the number of fish, little fish, that I needed uh, to create the larger rock fish. I visited, visited the site uh, many times and uh, then superimposed my rendering onto that photograph. Um, it's really a, a pretty ideal location with great visibility from the land and water. And uh, e even the compass rose that's on the existing slab um, complemented the piece, I thought. So I was selected. Um, then met with the city, began planning the details of making the sculpture. Um, I outsourced the roll forming of the support pipe and the fish armature for which I made this fabrication drawing on the right and uh, an assembly layout shown in the bottom left drawing. I took uh, very precise measurements so I could um, make the large fish seem alive and um, created a life-size drawing on plywood to work on top of. I laid out the final height and also um, superimposed the size of my trailer, uh, but just to verify that I could actually transport it when it was completed. Um, because this commission required me to provide a completed installation, which meant not only making the sculpture, but transporting it, digging the footer, pouring the concrete. Um, I also made an outdoor welding area just outside my studio so that the uh, fumes from welding stainless steel, which are, are carcinogenic, <laughs> would disperse. And um, I could also lift and manipulate the sculpture by myself using a trolley on an I-beam that I installed overhead. I, uh, I nested nine different fish shapes and many sizes of those shapes. Uh, and created a file to be laser cut by a company in Pennsylvania who did a great job cutting 600 fish from 1 8 inch thick stainless steel. I made the, uh, the armature a uh, wooden form and began welding. Uh, once I completed the one side, I had to go inside to weld the fish on as I wanted as few welds as possible on the outside of the sculpture. Uh, I really enjoyed working on this piece. As it came together, I began experimenting with surface finishes. The, uh, the eye holes were constructed with structural pipe uh, to be used as lift holes. Um, I designed a sort of a foolproof connection of the fish armature to the support pole since this was a major stress point. Then I attached the tail fin and worked on uh, surface finishes of individual fish. I really liked the effect, especially in full sun. Um, I designed and constructed a, sort of a medieval style hoist because renting a large crane was problematic, um, both for the site and the cost. Um, and then I backed the trailer under the fish, loaded it, uh, disassembled the hoist, loaded that, drove it and the sculpture to Habit of Grace, which is only about two and a half hours from my studio. Um, I rented a small excavator, dug the footer hole in one day, uh, positioned the sculpture on the next, uh, assembling the hoist, and then remove the trailer uh, from under it. Um, the, uh, the hole 
for the footer took four and a half yards of concrete to fill it. So on the third day, I poured concrete with the help of a buggy and my nephew. Um, and once it was set and blocked, I waited for the concrete to cure, which was uh, really just in time for the dedication. Um, this is the, the finished piece just before it was unveiled. Um, some interesting facts about the piece. I chose 317 stainless steel because it resists salt corrosion. Um, the sculpture itself weighs 600 pounds, including the pole, and the concrete weighs 18,000 pounds to offset the leverage from the, the cantilever. Um, there ended up being a total of 559 little fish that I used to make the large rockfish. And I, I think um, I, a, a, a successful sculpture must work on several levels. Um, besides meeting the original requirements, it should be uh, you know, visually stunning, safe, durable, interesting, um, but also have meaning. And this meaning is um, uh, of a large fish made up of small fish is, is a simple one. You know, we saw it in, in Finding Nemo, um, but it's also profound. Um, the idea of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts and the feeling of um, collective heroism that can exist when multitudes work together toward a goal and uh, a really big, great, big great thing uh, is made up of many little great things or acts um, and also things should be fun I think. Um, the dedication was fun and, and a big relief that it was you know successfully installed and, and well received and the uh, the night illumination effect was also fun um, and that's Big Fish School of Fish. So thank you very much for listening. And it was a, a great pleasure to speak with everyone. Thank you, Stephen. Thomas. <laughs> Thomas, That's I'm okay. sorry. Take care. Thank you very much. Is Ghazali back? Yeah, I'm right here. Oh, great. Our next artist is Ghazali Odiemo, uh, who was going to be teaching in our fibers program this week. He was born in a small rural village of Afetero, Nigeria. From a very young age, he realized his artistic potential and would attend social gatherings, such as weddings, naming and burial ceremonies, and other cultural parties, offering to sketch portraits of the guests for a small donation. He worked at the Nike Center for Arts and Culture for six years. In 1995, Ghazali's artwork was exhibited in Beirut, Germany, alongside the work of five other artists from Nigeria, which launched his career. In 1996, he was invited to the University of Iowa to do a series of exhibitions and workshops. Once there, the Octagon Gallery in Ames, Iowa, took notice of his work and presented his first solo exhibition in the United States. He has recently taught workshops at the World Batik Conference, Cross Culture Collaborative Incorporated, Snow Farm, and the Fiber Arts Center. Ghazali plans to continue to travel worldwide sharing the arts and culture of the Yoruba people of Nigeria. He currently resides in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Welcome, Ghazali. Uh, thank you so much. I could not see my face by any chance, so I don't know. Maybe something I need to. Yeah, now here we go. <laughs> yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for for coming tonight. Um, I'd like to begin because when I was a young kid back home in where I was born in Nigeria, I grew up with, from. Uh, fifth to sixth generation who was doing the traditional dye. 
pretty much what I'm going to talk about tonight a little bit is why fiber hat was so important in my culture. Until when I came to United States, I don't know you can carry identification, but until when I come here, I find out later. But in my country, where I came from in Nigeria, you can see some of my slideshow, the dress code we have right now, and some people they are watching me tonight, how I dress. So that is my identification. And that is what the fiber hat and the color I love to talk about a little bit tonight, which is indigo, the natural dye. What is represent in my culture, which is color of peace, color of love, and color of unity. That is what we call the color, because it brings us together. It makes us people identify what group we belong to in my country, in Nigeria. Myself, I came from Southwest. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Yoruba. So this is related to part of the life, how I grew up in, as a young kid in my country. And most of the design, we apply on the fabric, which is our begin from Adire. Adire Leko, which is from cassava. So mostly it represents a lot of message because back home in Africa, we use the symbol to, to grow up our community and to send the message because when I was a young kid, there's no there is no public uh, press, like a uh, television or something like a public news. So we use those de design with my parents to pass the message along the side. My slide is kind of a little bit moving too quick to the front, but you can see on the screen, like passing the knowledge. This is what wake me up every day. And you can see some screen. I'm in structure also. I'm supposed to be at the Peters Valley because of the pandemic. So that is what I've been doing since over 25 years I've been moving to United States. But the question remains, people say, do you go back home? Yes. I try to go back to Nigeria every twice a year. I just came back a couple months before the pandemic come up and then right now I'm in my studio. So I still continue doing what is my, my mom, the knowledge she passed to me as a young kid. We are five children. So only two of us follow my mom footprint. And you can see a little writing under my indigo. This is the plant. That is why we pray every day when we wake up in southwest of Nigeria. Indigo, we never die because the joy, the beauty, the blue we get from the plant. And there's no secret to it. But the only question I run to when I travel all over the global, people always ask me, ask me that, oh, do you grow your indigo? I don't grow my own indigo. When I was in India, I went to Mexico, a lot of places in around the global, people have their indigo farm, but indigo grew by himself in my country. People visit in my place in Nigeria, you can buy it on the open market in Nigeria. But the thing is, what I let people understand as a one of die artists, indigo has been using for so many things before we think about about the dying with it in my country. And you can see through my hand, the vibrant, when you put it in the dye vat, how long you need to stay there before you take it out. And also how do we even prepare the vat from beginning, from the plant? You just have to sit for several days with cold vat. That is why I call my indigo Yoruba indigo is a code vat 
it doesn't need any temperature. The only thing you're afraid of for me to live here in Santa Fe, because in the winter, I don't do so many dying because of I live in high elevation. Also, it get cold in the night. It dropped to 30 degree in the winter or 20 degree. <clears throat> Excuse me, if I have to use indigo very urgent, then I need to use electric blanket to keep my vat really warm. Now I want to move to the technique. This is what I really want to bring to Peter's Valley. The top design is called Batik, the sky blue one. And the middle one, that one is called Adire. Adire Eleko. What is the meaning of Adire? Adire is Adi, Are, anything you tie, anything you paint on, anything you resist, that is what we call it in my country, Nigeria. You can see some people read some little writing. They said, okay, what is okay mean? The little spiral in the middle, that is a record for me as a young kid grew up in 70. I can see the turntable, the music we play in the olden days. Basically, most of the design we are applying on our home fabric in Africa is the life we live in here. And that gives me a lot of opportunity to ask my parents about the each design. Sometimes you see somebody wear the cloth in Africa with somebody's name and they have a picture of somebody. So it's a way to keep the tradition. That is why it was so powerful. It was so deep, not only ordinary fabric. And this is the name, but also I like to show my beginning because this is my, this is how I make my living. The only, a lot of questions I run to the United States when people ask me here, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm an artist. They say, oh, that's what you do? Yes, that is what I do because I'm a full-time artist. I teach in public school here and this is my life in 1992. This is Eremont when I was teaching there a couple of years ago. And this is what still keep me moving around every time because I just love to pass the knowledge from one place to another and also to promote African heart, to let people understand how deep African heart was, was African heart and what is the message behind it and how it was so important in my culture and what is the message because all the design you see right now is not my improvise. It's a message. It's a life, as I said earlier, we live in him in part of my community where I was growing up. Then I'm moving to Adireleko right now. <clears throat> Adireleko technique is a different technique. You can see on the right side, in your side, maybe left side. That was hand painted. Adireleko is a very close to, very close to painting, very symmetrical. I use a chicken feather and this broom straw and a small knife. Hand painted, then I use the stencil, aluminum. That is what I pour in the paste before I make the design onto the, into the fabric. And People say, what kind of the resist do you use? I use the tapioca, cassava. I know people took a lot of uh, Japanese technique. They say, oh, I think I use the rice paste. This is why this is so traditional in my culture because cassava is a very highly food we eat in Nigeria. It saved our life. It took three years to grow the tuber before we make it to be food. And you can see the before and after. The reason why Adire was so amazing, you only resist the top. When you look the left or right side, you can see the back is blue. And, and this is the result. And all the P's, as I said, they all have a meaning. Like the one on the one say, okay, like a spiral, that one is called Ipadadun, 
Ibadado means my casa is your casa. My home, my village is very sweet. And the other one in the left side here, we call it Sun Baby. Lift up your bead. Because when people dancing in Africa, we wear the bead on our waist. You can see the bead was showing when people was playing music. So it's part of the life we live in it, and that is what we transform as a message, as a tradition. Adire Oniko, I wish I have a lot of time because that is my, that is my really, what make me happy when I talk about the most of the design. You can see pigeon eyes, pigeon, we call it Eyele, Eyele ki mu, yeri. But I like to say it in my Yoruba language. PG is one of the board, loving board in my, in my culture. But when I came to the United States, people said PG is very bad because they rip off your roof, they poop everywhere. But there's a story behind the design. When people wear this design in Africa, it's a way of showing love to other people, how you love them. And that is what is the tie-dye, the PG was represented in my culture. Then. It's not only this tie, also we're going to stitching as well in my technique. The top one is tie, the middle one is called the beginning of life. That is the name of the design. But the one in the bottom, that one is a stitching, which is we call it adire, alabere, it is a stitching. I know my time is getting close. Mm -hmm. We wear Adire as a fashion high life in my culture. And it's very, you can see in the bottom, my generation, they bring it to different level. You can see it, how people, and also, this is my last image. Indigo, unite the world. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Kisali. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody, all of the instructors. I'll start with uh, thanking Thomas since I messed his, messed his name up <laughs> to begin with. But um, thank you, Thomas. And, and thank you, Eric and Lori and Sashka. And thank you, Ghazali, for the final presentation. Um, also, thank you, all of those of you who joined us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your presence here and your interest. And um, I just want to let you all know that uh, every year we have a, an a, a exhibition by all of the instructors who are going to be with us for the summer. Uh, this year, that exhibition, which is called Makers uh, Matter, um, is going to be presented online. And the opening reception is this weekend. It's on Sunday at 4 o'clock p.m. And uh, you just go, if you'd like to join us, um, you're welcome to go to the website and register there, just like you did tonight. And we hope that you'll join us every Friday night going on through the rest of the summer. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>